you're listening to the SAS Says Podcast. I'm your host, Christy Rocha, also known as SAS. I identify as a woman, a wife, and a mother. That should tell you a lot already. And over the last few years, I've learned the value of talk therapy. I have seen how my inner work not only enhances my own well-being, but also my marriage, my parenting, my relationships. And in fact, you wouldn't be hearing this right now if it weren't for the work I've done. My mission is to debunk the misconceptions and stigmas around what therapy is and who it's for. Let's normalize working on our mental health and seeking help when needed. We've all heard of self-care, self-help, and self-love, but do you often wonder how to actually make it all happen? I do. You'll hear strategy-based conversations with professionals, as well as inspiring and validating stories from women who are just like you and me. Think of this podcast as the weekly therapy sessions you didn't know you needed, with a dash of sass, a lot of vulnerability, and me, relentlessly asking, but how? Hello, hello. I am so excited. Today, Jax Anderson is here. She is a licensed professional counselor and creator and owner of the brand, The Psychotherapist. Jax has always been told that she beats to the rhythm of her own drum. And most of her life, she grew up thinking that that was a criticism. So she got a little bit older and realized that it was more of a, gosh, I wish I had her guts sentiment instead. This perspective shift encouraged her to embrace her uniqueness, empower herself, and choose to be bold. Jax became what's known as a disruptor, disrupting the status quo, offering alternative perspectives, teaching and training people to shift. She does things differently, but most importantly, she does things. She accepts challenges with an I can do this mentality where others might shy away. Jax's why is simply to empower, motivate, and inspire as many people as possible. And let me tell you, she's doing just that because more recently, she's become famous, yes, famous, on TikTok, known as the TikTok Mom, helping tweens, teens, and their parents better communicate and understand each other. Today, we discuss why and when to get your kids into therapy, the whole screen time dilemma, her thoughts on gentle parenting, some of the mistakes parents make in parenting tweens and teens, and Jax's personal approach to her own mental health and motherhood. And as always, make sure to stay tuned after the show for my final thoughts. Hey, Jax, thank you so much for joining me. Hi, Christy. Thanks for having me. (laughs) The psychotherapist is here face to face. I can't believe it. (laughs) We were just saying that it kind of is great to see people that you've connected with it on online because it's like putting a face, like you said, to a cartoon character or something. Yeah, like meeting a character in a comic book that you've yeah. been reading about and engaging with for a while. I know. It's very cool. I feel like I'm talking to a little bit of a celebrity, so... <laughs> Well, I don't know about that. I'm not verified yet, so... You're not? <laughs> no. I'm TikTok surprised. is weird. I yeah, I feel like there's been a little bit of an uproar the last week or so about things happening over there. They mm-hmm. need some help. But anyway. Yeah, they went down. They yeah. They down for yeah. what, yeah. Mm-hmm. That being said, TikTok is how I found you and your account. What mm-hmm. What is that like for you to now be this public figure? It's very humbling. Mm. It's something that I've enjoyed for sure. I love to inspire, empower, and motivate as many people as possible. And ever since I started my brand and my business, I've been saying that. And it just took off on TikTok, my videos. And it's been a humbling experience. I've There's highs and lows that mm-hmm. come along with it. But I've met a lot of awesome people. And I've heard amazing stories, the good, the bad, the ugly, And I've been able to provide people with a listening ear and validation and people just want to be heard. Mm. So it's been, it's, it's, it's an honor, really. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, I think one of the differentiating factors about your account is how specific you get with your content. I Mm -hmm. think that I've seen other accounts addressing parenting where 
you know, I, I know it's hard because every kid, every parent's different, right? But you actually walk people through very specific, what I imagine to be conversations you hear with from your clients, maybe even your own kids that are so helpful. And that is actually the word you use for it, unhelpful versus helpful parenting responses that as parents, we actually hear ourselves saying or the inclination to say, I mean, do you find that you're speaking mostly to parents or kids as well? I started out speaking to parents Mm -hmm. when I, before the pandemic started, before we were locked down, I had gone to social media marketing world in San Diego and I wanted to learn more about TikTok because it was this new, well, to me, it was new. Mm -hmm. And I learned that there are a lot more adults on TikTok than I had originally thought. So when the pandemic hit, I wanted to reach out to parents and help them hear themselves through my videos. Mm. So what happened, however, is I got a lot of teenager followers, Mm. adolescents, tweenagers. I think I have a great deal of adult women followers as well. But I have a fair share of teenage cl- or clients. Listen to me. Like, they're all my clients. <laughs> teenage followers on TikTok as well who, you know, will you adopt me? Will you be my TikTok mom? And oh my. I know. So that's why the hashtag TikTok mom is in my posts because so many kids have said that. And wow. I thought, sure, I, yeah, I'll be, I'll be your TikTok mom, wow. you know? So, yeah. But so originally it was for parents, but the the way it turned out is kids are sending these videos to their parents. And what happens often is when I look in my messages, I'll see parents sending me messages such as, my teenager sent me your video. Thank you so much for making these. I'm following you now. This is great. And That's amazing. So, mm-hmm, yeah. That's so refreshing to hear. I mean, I feel like the the younger generations are just so much more open to all styles of communication, mental health, therapy. I mean, now, so that's an amazing outcome. That's Mm -hmm. wonderful. Mm -hmm. Have you also experienced the reverse? Absolutely. Yeah. I wouldn't say that I get too much hate, Mm. but when it, when I do, it's, it's hesitation, it's defensiveness. Mm. The people that hate on my videos or disagree with me, I don't take offense to it. I don't get upset because I understand they're coming from their own experience, their own perceptions, their own trauma, perhaps. Mm. And they're reacting to a perspective that they are uncomfortable with. Mm. And I know my style is a little bit more two by four to the face. <laughs> than, <laughs> you know, I know that I'm bold with my, <laughs> with my stuff and I've always been that way. Yeah. So I know that it can be challenging <laughs> to hear it like that. So I try to look at those situations as opportunities to possibly reach somebody mm. with a different perspective. Mm-hmm. But so so sometimes I'll respond, but I also have those moments where I just delete and block because and the reason why I do that, I don't I'm not deleting and blocking necessarily because of me. Mm-hmm. I'm deleting and blocking because I don't want other people on in the comment section to get triggered or traumatized by somebody else's disrespect. Interesting. And that's why I delete and block if I see it. Mm. Yeah. I didn't, especially thinking about teens and tweens following you and reading, they don't have the perspective to filter. Right. And they don't have perhaps maybe the self-awareness and the confidence to say, well, that doesn't work for me. Mm -hmm. I know what works for me and that's why I'm here. Would you, would you qualify or I guess call your, your style or your approach other than being a two by four to the face, (laughs) 
<laughs> would it fall under that that gentle parenting category that yes. yeah that, okay mm -hmm. so what does that mean to you um gentle parenting to me means emotional connection mm -hmm. connecting before correcting Ooh, like emotionally one. reaching them on uh in that level that isn't doing anything to gain their compliance but understanding where this behavior is coming from mm -hmm. so listening validating using empathy and helping them move and shift those emotions that are creating the behavior. Mm. Certainly there are extenuating circumstances such as ADHD or autism might be present or any other number of disabilities that could be in existence for those kids or the parent. Yeah. So then there's a disconnect and there are other accommodations that maybe need to be set in place. Mm -hmm. So in general, my videos are targeted toward um, neurotypical audience. Okay. So if there are, and that's why at the end of some of my videos, I'll say there could be extenuating circumstances in effect here, but TikTok only gives me a minute to really right. cover this stuff. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> so. Yeah. And like we said, I said earlier, I mean, truly every kid is different right i mean you can mm -hmm. you can give very specific examples and you can speak on you know kind of the buzz issues right but mm -hmm. what's actually going to work for someone in their home depends greatly on the kid and the caregiver and truly what the circumstance is at home absolutely like, every home is different every person is different every trauma is different mm -hmm. uh cultures are different yeah. So it, it plays a role. Yeah. Trauma. That's a word I'm really exploring. And I think that I think that it applies greatly to this conversation because what I'm learning as an adult now is that trauma for me could be something completely different for another person. And it you know, I feel like there are the generally accepted traumas, right? Death, rape. I don't know that uh, those are the two big ones that car accident car accident mm -hmm. things that are coming to mind and those are the types of things that I think most people think of when you say trauma but trauma and I would ask for your opinion that could be you know a, a girl click at middle mm -hmm. school and mm -hmm. that leaves your kid out or that sends I don't know we used to send notes but I'm sure now it's sending dms or whatever and I think kind of realizing that trauma at the level of a, a tween or a tween is very different right. now than maybe it was for us as the parents absolutely 100 percent. I always tell people trauma is in the eye of the beholder mm. so if you and I were standing on a corner of a busy street and we were standing in the same place and witnessed a car accident from the same angle, saw the same thing. I get totally traumatized mm -hmm. and I can't walk outside anymore. And you might be like, what? It was just a car accident. Mm -hmm. Everybody was fine. It's okay. Yeah. But based on our physiology, based on our experiences and observations growing up, our relationships, how we were treated, how people behaved around us, it all affects our perceptions in life. Mm -hmm. So something that might be extremely traumatic to me may not be to you, even though we witness the same thing from the same angle. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's just as you're talking, it's what's coming to mind is I think as adults, you know, it, I think it's kind of the same thing. You forget, like people say, oh, you forget the newborn phase. You forget the toddler phase, how hard it is once you're out of it. It's like we forget what it's like to be a teenager. Mm -hmm. We forget how real and intense those challenging moments can be for kids. And I think we tend to underestimate kids in that way. I mean, can you speak to some of maybe the mistakes that parents make when either trying to communicate with their kids or just mistakes they make in straight up parenting kids of that age? 
absolutely i mean how much time that's like how much time i know i know i know well maybe maybe some of the more common ones or you know things that you experienced recently yeah so i i don't know what happened to me there's something maybe maybe this is a i look at it as a gift but i never was granted that um repression of what teenage life was like i remember it yeah Mm -hmm. i I remember it vividly at times. I still have dreams wow. sometimes about being a teenager, but maybe that's because I work with teenagers yeah. all the time. Yeah. Uh, they keep me young. But um, I think one of the biggest mistakes that parents make is when we're raising our kids, we get them to about age eight, nine, and we're in a pretty good groove. Mm. We've gotten a handle on parenting our kid. We know the system, the the structure is down. We know our kid, they know us. And then boom, they change. Mm. And they start going through that tween age development. Mm. And then the teenage development, the hormones kick in, the brain starts developing differently. And parents continue to try and parent as if their kid was a child Mm -hmm. rather than taking the perspective that they're now a teenager, they're now a teenager. And so they continue to parent in those ways that they got in the groove of that used to work this disciplinarian, this, you know, I'm going to take your phone if you don't put the dishes away. Mm -hmm. All of these things that maybe worked before, they aren't going to work now. So parents have to learn a different way of relating to their kids, of parenting their kids, because when their kid hits the teenage years, they're no longer a child. They're an adult in training. (laughs) And so parents taking that perspective, it can really help them with relating to their teenager when they look at them as an adult in training. Absolutely, you're still their parent. Absolutely, they still need you. They absolutely need you to set limits and model healthy boundaries, model respecting them and respecting other people. They need you to do those things, but they need you to do them in a different way. Hmm. And I think that's one of the biggest mistakes that parents make is digging in and trying to maintain or establish some sort of dominance or control rather than being flexible. Mm. I wonder, and you will know, but I, I wonder, does that a little bit come from fear? When in parents, you know, fear of letting letting the reins go a little bit and wanting to be protective. You know, I, I just, as you're talking, I'm wondering, yeah, that sounds wonderful. And I will want to give my kids some some slack and some rope to go. But, you know, you always, I always think my mom has this saying, like, you know, just anytime I like wouldn't check in as a kid or something. And she's like, I know I always trust you, but I just don't want to be that parent on the 11 o'clock news where they're like, excuse me, Mrs. So-and-so, didn't you wonder why your kid didn't call you and blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. And how do you talk parents through that? So this is what. You're hundred percent right. And I experienced this myself with my daughter, <clears throat> excuse me. And what I will say to parents and what I say to myself, cause I have to check myself on this too, is, is that fair to your kid? Hmm. It's your stuff. It's your fears. Yeah. It's your anxiety. It's your desire not to be that mom on the news. Yeah. How is that fair <laughs> to your kid? How are you limiting them by putting your needs ahead of theirs? Mm. And that usually works for me. It works for a lot of people when they split it that way. Now, I still have compassion for myself and other parents. This isn't easy. Nobody said parenting was easy and you're going to take two steps forward and then you're going to take five back. And that's just... That's the rhythm of it. You're never going to get into a place where you're like, okay, I have become the best parent that I can be. I'm done. I'm just (laughs) going to keep doing what I'm doing now. Like you you don't plateau as a parent. (laughs) Like, you know, (laughs) there's constant challenges and it's constantly a, a work on yourself. Yeah. And 
however, a lot of parents look at it as a working on their kids yes. to change and control their kids' behavior so that that adult can feel better. Mm. And that's backwards. Yeah. We have to work on ourselves because we can't get in the way of our kids' appropriate development. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking even of my own experience. I'm a newer mom. I'm I'm Mm -hmm. only three and a half in three and a half years into this gig now. But yeah, (laughs) I think, you know, we're not we're not ready for that. We're not prepared Mm -hmm. for that generally. Right. So it's I think physically we become I'm just saying moms because I'm speaking about myself physically. I became a mom much quicker than I realized that I needed to become a mom emotionally. Mm -hmm. And that's a that's a hard transition I think you know we're so up until that point life's about me life is about me and Mm -hmm. and that transition to oh it's still about me but it's for the sake Mm -hmm. of this other person and I have Mm -hmm. to now incorporate their needs into that I mean it's it sounds really simplistic but it's not it's major Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. yeah and this is why I say I think everybody should be in therapy. <laughs> I love that you just said that. I was just going to mm-hmm. ask you if yeah. if about that. Yeah. Everybody should be in therapy. That doesn't mean that everybody requires a diagnosis. Right. That doesn't mean that everybody requires trauma therapy or right. really deep psychotherapy. But everybody ought to be in counseling with a professional at some at, at in some regard. Yeah. Because stuff is going to come up, whether you're a parent or not. You could be a dog parent <laughs> and your dog goes through a trauma and stuff comes up for you. You know, it it's just being aware of your own stuff yeah. and how your stuff is affecting you and possibly fa- affecting the relationships in your life. Mm-hmm. And is it fair to those people <clears throat> that you're trying to control them so that you feel better? Yeah. Yeah, I think that is what I'm coming across in, you know, different conversations with, you know, your colleagues, your fellow content creators, Mm -hmm. that one of the biggest misconceptions about therapy is that there has to be something definitively wrong with you, or that you had to have suffered one of the generally accepted traumas. Mm -hmm. And it's so, it's so not that. Right, right, right. (laughs) Or it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. Right. You know? Exactly. Well, yeah. psychology, psychotherapy, if you go historically speaking, was created to treat, and I'm putting this in quotes, hysterical women. <laughs> oh so it was created by white men to treat <laughs> what wasn't <laughs> hysterical women. Yeah. And I know what wasn't created yeah. by. Yeah. But so psychology and psychotherapy for a long time was you know, kind of effed up in a lot of ways. And, but that doesn't mean that it still is. Mm -hmm. We have come a long way in psychology Mm -hmm. and we certainly still have far to go, but we have come a long way in different therapy techniques. We don't just have people sit on the couch, lay on the couch anymore, facing away from us, just free talking. About, yeah. How does that make you feel? Right, exactly. Yeah. I rarely ask my clients, right. how does that make you feel? I don't think I've ever been asked that in <laughs> almost three years of therapy. Right. right. I mean, there are therapeutic techniques right now where you like such as brain spotting. Mm. You can do a brain spotting technique with somebody and they don't ever have to talk. Some what of my does clients that, mean? Re- what that, what does that, that means mean? that everything I'm talking, right. I'm directing them, but they don't ever have to talk. They're experiencing the therapy inside of them. They can share if they want to, but they don't have to share. It's huh. still working. Your brain is wired to heal. All we have to do is get out of the way. Mm. And when I say your brain is wired to heal, I don't mean People with diagnoses. I don't mean people with severe issues. I don't, I mean anybody, Mm -hmm. anybody. So it includes people with diagnoses. It includes people with severe issues. It includes people that just want to attend to their mental health on a regular basis. So psychotherapy has come a long way and it's, it's not as archaic as it used to be. And anybody can benefit from it. There's a difference between caring for your mental health and psychotherapy. Yeah. I I just want to note that 
as you were initially talking about the history of psychotherapy, I could feel my whole left side tense up. That is the <laughs> side that I carry stress. And sure. it just, I just felt literally felt like that. And I, well, yeah. no one can see me, but I was, I'm showing my shoulder tense up and having to say to myself, relax, it's okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. and I think that, um, uh, well, I, I'll, I'll transition it into what advice would you give to parents who are entering into possibly a therapeutic relationship with their kid or just being the parent kind of on the sideline of a kid's relationship with a therapist? Mm -hmm. It's a hard thing for a parent to do. It is knowing that your kid is sharing intimate details about their life with, with somebody else Mm -hmm. who is pretty much a stranger to you and they aren't sharing it with you. And you're trusting this other adult, this professional to absolutely tell you if there's something that you need to know. Mm -hmm. It's a lot. That's a big ask for a lot of parents, especially if those parents have never been to therapy before or have a a prejudgment about therapy or had a bad experience themselves. Mm -hmm. So some of the things that I would recommend is maybe most definitely sharing that with the therapist. Mm -hmm. And that can mean. I would like to have a, uh, maybe a meet and greet with you ahead of time to share my concerns, my worries, and ask that therapist the questions that they have mm-hmm. about how do you handle this situation? How would you handle that situation? Kind of like an interview. Mm-hmm. Not all professional therapists will offer a complimentary meet and greet. I, I do. <clears throat> a lot of therapists do. But if they don't offer one, you can either move on to another therapist mm-hmm. or see if they would be willing to maybe answer some questions via email. Right. Sometimes they're willing to do that. But, you know, therapists are busy and I understand that they don't always have the time to respond or make room for a uh, meet and greet. Right. I happen to have that luxury and a lot of other therapists do, some don't. <clears throat> but I think also being very communicative with the counselor throughout sessions You know, and the counselor can help with this process by saying to the teenager, too, I've said this to teenagers before, like your mom or your dad seem pretty nervous about you coming here. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that they keep bringing you because you're getting something out of this. Mm -hmm. How do you think we can help them feel a little more relaxed about this process? Do you think if I connected with them more often, if we both did at the end of session and maybe shared a little bit about what's going on, do you think that would help? And so we, I plan with the teenager uh, a little bit, like how can we help your parent feel a little more comfortable with this process so they keep bringing you? I and imagine, teens are usually really into that. I was going to say, I, I imagine they must feel very empowered by that. Yeah, yes, yes. That is my entire goal when I do therapy with teenagers. I tell them right in front of their parents. I say, your parents might be f- paying the bills. Your parents might be setting up these appointments and bringing you, transporting you. But I work for you. Mm-hmm. You're the boss. You say who, you say when, you say oh my where. Goodness. Yeah. I work for you. They must you can love fire me. That. Oh yeah, they love it. Because it, it, but it's true. Yeah, it's absolutely mm-hmm. true. They are my client, and I say that in front of the parents. And I've never had a parent balk at that. Mm. But I've always had teenagers kind of be like, "Wow, yeah, I'm empowering you. You are in control of this process. You don't have to say." I tell them, "You don't have to talk at all if you don't want to. Yeah. If you don't want to talk." We don't have to talk. We can just sit here. We play games. We'll do whatever you want to do. Yeah. Yeah. What What is usually going on for a kid or a household or parents that is is bringing them to you? Are there things consistently that you see that are? uh, I'm sure that that's another loaded. How much time do you have? Question. But what? At what? And I guess also too, if within that you could touch on. At what point is this just normal teenage family stuff? Mm. And then, no, we really need some more help. Mm -hmm. Uh, Some of the common reasons that teenagers are brought to counseling and 
when I mention these, understand that 95% of the time it's really bad. Like they've waited too long. Uh, (laughs) Like, you know what I mean? Most people do. We wait, we wait too long. We try and do it on our own. We try to pretend there's not a problem and then boom, we have to go. So they come because maybe there's some self-harm, depression, Mm -hmm. suicidal ideation going on. Okay. Um, They come because their parents will say they're uncontrollable. So they're having temper tantrums, they're irritable, they're running away, they're not listening, they're not doing their chores, they're stuck in their room all day, they're not coming out, you know, if I took their phone away, they they just wouldn't do anything, mm. uh, they don't talk to me. Um, another big reason is poor grades, mm. they're not showing up for school, they're not doing their schoolwork, they're, we're really worried about them not mm. passing this year. Uh, social issues, they're being bullied, Uh, the kids are making fun of them, they don't, you know, they're super anxious, they don't want to go to school anymore, they don't even want to get on the bus, can you help them with their anxiety? Mm -hmm. So those are some of the, I mean, I could go on and on, but those are some of the pretty common ones. So in in thinking about the fact that most most parents or most kids have waited too long, Mm -hmm. what are maybe some warning signals or what does the phase look like when we should start, Mm -hmm. you know, before it gets too far? Yeah, absolutely. And again, I think everybody should be in counseling. (laughs) Would you even apply that to to teenagers? Yes, absolutely. I was just going to say when kids are reaching the age of tween age, to teenager, it's yeah. a massive transition. Yeah. And I would love to see uh, them be assessed during that time, even if it's just kind of like a once a month check in mm-hmm. with a professional counselor, just to kind of help guide the family mm-hmm. through this process. Mm-hmm. I think that would be a, that would be such a significant improvement mm-hmm. by in the world, yes. I think, by doing that. Yes. But some of the signs, yeah, I I think it'd be a great idea. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to knock on school counselors here because I love school counselors. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I could never do their job. Yeah. And I love them. But they don't have the time to do individual things. Right. they've got every kid (laughs) and every issue and every, yeah, it's overwhelming. Right. So that's not enough. So when parents hear from their kids teachers or the school counselor and they're starting to hear concerns from them that would be a good time Mm -hmm. if they hear if if suddenly their kid um goes from in initiating social activities with their friends joining their friends they, they suddenly go from involved in things even activities or hobbies and then not Mm. That would be a good time mm-hmm. to take them to a counselor before it gets too bad. Yeah. Um, if they experience a trauma, like they're involved in a car accident, they uh, witness a car accident, parents get divorced mm-hmm. or separated, uh, somebody in the family passes away, mm-hmm. that would be a really good time to take them to a therapist. Yeah. Even before they have any sort of reaction to it. Yeah get them into a therapist because trauma, it will, it'll work its way in there. And if it's not resolved, it will come back later. It's like, it'll like rot you from the inside out like an apple. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm, I'm thinking of some of the teens in my life and it sounds like in addition to you know, the bigger life changing events, mm-hmm. just when you start to recognize your kid doing, saying, behaving in ways that they maybe are not what you would consider are true to character or true to form. And what I can imagine is as being very difficult for parents today, and maybe you can speak to this, but kids are just on their phones and their whole yeah. world is on a screen. And mm-hmm. I I just can imagine how difficult it must be to actually determine is something different or is this Mm -hmm. just like an addiction for my kid? You know Mm -hmm. what I mean? I don't know. Like how, how do parents get in there? Mm -hmm. (laughs) How do parents 
<laughs> you know, I right. don't know. I mean, and and you can tie that to the whole screen time, internet sure. conversation a little because at least for what I see, that's a that's a big. It's a big one. It's a big one. Mm-hmm. Um, first and foremost, the screens aren't going away. They're here <laughs> to stay. So yeah. we just need to accept that. Mm-hmm. And when I think about people sitting on their phones, I think about subway trains in the 1950s where people were just reading the paper. They weren't talking to one another or yeah. looking at each other. They were reading the paper. Right. And <clears throat> granted, whether you're reading a paper or you're reading on the phone, you're reading. You're, you're, you're with yourself, yeah. not interacting with other people. Mm-hmm. But can phones be addicting can it be uh a chemically can it chemically change in your system can it change your brain yes wow so it is definitely something to monitor Mm -hmm. and limit especially for young developing brains Mm -hmm. however be careful how much you limit talk with your kid about it talk with your kid's counselor about it talk with your spouse about it Talk with the other parents of other kids that your kid is hanging out with about it. See what they're doing. Yeah. And if you can have a strong communicative support system like that of people that, hey, you know, I saw that so-and-so was online for like eight hours the other day, you know, is everything okay? You know, oh, yeah, I was, I, we were out of town and we told them whatever, like go to town, dude, you know, <laughs> whatever it is. Right. But having people that are involved and can help keep them safe, too, because safety is a huge concern. There are evil people out there that are going to try to take advantage of kids online. Mm -hmm. And I think that we're in this transition time where a lot of parents like me, I I grew up, we didn't have Internet. Then we had Internet. And now we have this like super awesome internet. So <laughs> it's, you know, it's like no internet, email, and yeah. now social media. You know? yeah. Yeah. So, so as a parent, I had to consider all that when I, when I had my kid and I started talking to her when she was old enough to talk about, you know, screen time and having face-to-face conversations. I would you know, in front of her, take my phone, whenever she would come to um, ask me a question, I would let her see that I would put my phone down. Mm. And I would give her time. So I was modeling this behavior that I wanted her to see. So now she's 10 years old. And when I go to talk to her, she puts her phone on pause, and she sets it down. And she says, what's up? Oh, my goodness. You know, so, so, modeling this and, and following through on your end Mm -hmm. is going to be huge for your kids. If your kids are already teenagers and you haven't established this with them when they were younger, start. Yeah. It's never too late. Yeah. You know, a lot of the parents quickly, right? Yes. They're so adaptable. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of the parents that complain to me about their kids being on the phone too much, I ask them, show me your phone screen time. Go into settings and show me yours. I know. Look at your face. I know. "Uh." I can't. And my Apple sends me that darn report every week. I'm like, geez, Louise. Oh, boy. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) Another episode of Frozen, whatever. Uh. Go ahead, kid. (laughs) I've got you beat by a mile. I know. Yeah, I know. And, And I think about people, you know, and for me, I can run my entire business and brand from my phone. I know. So I am definitely on my phone a lot. Yeah. And I have those conversations with my daughter, you mm-hmm. know, that mom is working right now. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean that you get to go be on screen time. That mm-hmm. I'm not having fun necessarily. I'm, I'm making content. I'm right. doing, you know, it just, we ha- I'm doing it on my phone, you know? So, but we also ask them, you know, we, they go to school. We say, here's an iPad. Here's a Chromebook. I know. Do all of your work on here, but then they don't be on the screen. Right. Like what? The mixed message is real. Yeah. 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 And I, so. I feel like you could 
make that case for so many things with yeah. parents and kids and and all of that. I mean, honestly, I'm just going to share this because it happened an hour ago mm-hmm. and it really ticked me <laughs> off. But okay. I called my... I called my son is young. He's a year and a half. I called the pediatrician. He's had a cold. And she's Mm -hmm. like immediately, she's like, oh, he has to come in. Like as if I've waited too long. Right. But meanwhile, this isn't my first rodeo. This is my second kid. I've spent two and a half years calling them at everything and them going, yeah, your kid's sick. It's okay. Just give them Tylenol and this and that. And I'm just like, like exactly that. Like, it's either it's either I'm reaching out and mm-hmm. you know I don't know that's a whole other thing with like medical stuff mm-hmm. with kids but mm-hmm. I feel like even with you know I don't even with dressing what they wear it's like express yourself do you yeah but don't wear that crop top but don't limit wear spaghetti it. straps that's yeah, cool right boys get distracted by your shoulders right. <laughs> But but at the same time, I can picture my husband's face the day my daughter is old enough to come downstairs in a crop mm-hmm. top. He's going to have mm-hmm. a heart attack. Mm-hmm. Like where? Like what else? What else do we see that in? I feel like even mm-hmm. to, um, you know, uh, the understanding that yeah, like at that age they're going to be rebellious. They're going right. to. That's what they're supposed to do, right? They're supposed to challenge us, but yes, only go so far with it. Yes. What do we do? What do we well, do? Well, that's that's why. I wish that there was some, well, that's why I'm making the content that I'm making Mm. and I'm doing the webinars that Mm -hmm. I'm doing. I just started a webinar, an educational series on understanding your teenager's brain. And I did 101. (laughs) It was a basic understanding the other night. And my hope is to help parents understand that the adolescent stage of development that their kid's brain is going to go through. Mm. If they can understand that, They'll understand why their kid has to rebel against them. Mm -hmm. It literally is biological. Their brain is screaming at that kid to (laughs) rebel and push away from parents. So the parents that are, oh, you don't love me anymore. Oh, you you just don't want to be around me anymore. You used to be so sweet. I don't want you to grow up. That is extremely harmful Mm. to your kid's biological development. Mm. So you're creating a codependency there. You're giving your child, you're telling them that they are responsible for your emotions. No, they're not. They're responsible for their emotions and they're just learning how to regulate them. Right. It's like that's that's the conversation Mm -hmm. mom and dad or dad and dad or mom and mom, whoever have on Saturday night after the kids are in bed or while they're out with their friends, that's the conversation you have with another adult. Mm -hmm. Yes. Not with your kid. Or with your therapist. (laughs) Yes, or with your therapist. (laughs) There go my dog. See? It's okay. Amazon's probably delivering something. (laughs) I don't know. Or there's a ghost or something. It's okay. Okay. Um... But yeah, you're right. I mean, you know, talking to another adult about your concerns because they're valid. Mm -hmm. It is a valid feeling to be sad when you're when you feel your kid pulling away from you. It's not fun. It's uncomfortable. And it's I mean, forever. You know, your your relationship with your child is changing forever and that you are allowed to grieve that. Just don't grieve it to your kid. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I I feel like that is, that goes back to that. I think we were talking about this earlier, but, you know, parenting is more about figuring your own stuff out and Mm -hmm. figuring out what, what you're triggered by and Mm -hmm. taking a look in before you react outwardly, especially in front of your kid. Absolutely. What did, Dan, oh, go go ahead. No, go ahead. Dan Siegel writes a really good book, Mm. Dr. Dan Siegel. He's a a neuropsychiatrist out in California, and he wrote a book called Parenting from the Inside Out. Mm. And it basically talks about what you just said. Mm -hmm. So checking in with yourself before uh, disciplining your kid. So if your kid does something, so say your kid is reaching the age 14, Mm -hmm. And when you were 14, you were a terror yeah. and you snuck out and you started drinking and all of these things at 14. When your kid reaches 14, 
all of that stuff that you did and that fear and that anxiety and that concern is going to come forward and we run the risk of parenting our kid as if they're doing it. Mm. Yeah. So making sure that your stuff stays with you <laughs> and your kid's stuff stays with them. Yeah. And that's what his book is about, parenting from the inside out. Yeah. It's really good. I'm going to buy that now. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> but again, and again, I'm just thinking as you're talking, this is not the type of stuff that is communicated to us when we're pregnant when we're even no. thinking about having a kid. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. everything is about the baby. Everything is about all the gadgets and the sleep on their back and this and that. I mean, nobody talks about this. I, see, the thing is, I don't know how you would grab the attention of someone who's not yet a parent to make them care. But I feel mm -hmm. like if you really were able to talk to this with, you know, the general population, mm -hmm. You'd either have people really committing to parenthood or you'd have people that go, you know what, maybe it's not for me. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, generally would make for a much healthier, healthier <laughs> place to be, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't know. That's, that's frustrating to me that I mean, we just send moms out and parents out into the wild. We present this beautiful picture of what having a family will be like or that it should be like and it's it's so much work in a way that mm -hmm. you cannot even anticipate mm -hmm. until you're in it mm -hmm. oh, it's frustrating it is frustrating <laughs> and it this just what we're talking about just I don't know, enunciates, highlights mm. the importance of mental health, caring for your mental health. Yeah. And that means understanding yourself so well that you're, you're aware and yeah. insightful of the things that are going on for your, for you. Mm -hmm. And you can emotionally connect with your kid without that baggage. Yeah. that's going on with you. You can compartmentalize it for a minute to be there for them. Yeah. And mental health, caring for your mental health will allow you to do that. Mm -hmm. And counselors can even help with the whole parenting thing. You know, if you were to go to any counselor and say, you know, my partner and I want to, our kid is getting, you know, up to five years old. We want to learn what this transition is going to be like when they get to the tween years. Can you help us with that? Yeah. Yeah. That, that that's, you know, and if they can't, then they'll refer you to somebody who can. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, how, how, I mean, how do you as Jax take care of mm -hmm. your mental health and your life and all that? Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. um, I have two therapists, mm -hmm. <laughs> one in real life and one online. Okay. <laughs> And one, I, I have two just because I like both their styles. And sometimes I need a more, more of a grandma kind of personality. And other okay. times I need the two by four to the face. Okay. So <laughs> I have two different therapists. Yeah. Um, I exercise works really well for me moving and not exercise like doing, you know, like hardcore middle-aged CrossFit every day, but <laughs> <laughs> like a pe like just riding on a bike or going, going outside and yeah. taking a walk mm -hmm. yoga mm -hmm. I love I have a hard time motivating myself to do yoga but when I'm doing yoga I'm like oh why don't I do this more often mm -hmm. you know because it's so good but mm -hmm. when I do my movement or my exercise I set the intention is this going to be a caring for my mental health movement or is this going to be caring for my physical health movement? Oh, yeah, that's really good. So yeah. the intention is different. Um, I need a lot of uh, introspection time. I, I, I'm a Scorpio, so I just need it naturally. But mm -hmm. being a therapist, I need time to be alone in peace and not be disrupted mm. because that's how my brain mm -hmm. puts the jigsaw puzzle of my day together and no pieces are left floating around that can cause, you know, uh, maybe a crap show the next day, mm -hmm. you know, like mm -hmm. I need that. If I don't get that, then I can 
you know, I can get kind of irritable, but <laughs> that's, that's what I do. I love, I love my five, four, three, two, one. I do that a lot. Okay. Um, singing in my car that helps music is great for me. Mm-hmm. And I just fit this in whenever I can. Yeah. You know? Yeah. My my next question was how, you know, how right. to make the time, how to mm-hmm. make the space. And I don't know. And maybe this has been something you've had to practice because for me, those little things that you can do in the few minutes here or there, it's sometimes they seem so simple that I'm like, uh, will it really help? Yeah. Do I need it to? Will. You know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it's... I know. It's like, well, I want to help myself. And then the moment comes and I'm like, eh. <laughs> I know. I have to do this instead. You know, it's I like, know. No, you don't. Just do the things that you need to do. <laughs> it's easy to skip it. It yeah. really is. And I think I got much better at it when I became a mom because the importance of modeling that is so significant mm. because I want my daughter to have a good example of people taking care of their mental health and their physical health. And I want to be that example for her. I want to model that having the following that I have on TikTok, I've got to practice what I preach. And I'm a person with integrity that will say, I'm not going to suggest you do something without trying it first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to say to people authentically, I do this as well. And yeah, I screw up. Like there are times when seasonal affect disorder can hit me pretty hard in the winters in Wisconsin. Mm. And sometimes I have a hard time shaking, shaking it loose in the spring. And I'll go sometimes weeks without doing anything. And I just, I don't want to do that. Oh, I don't want to do that. And I'll shake out of it and I'll get back on track. It happens to everybody. But Make the time for it, even if you have to schedule it like you schedule a doctor's appointment. You're going to show up for that doctor's appointment or you're going to pay a late fee. Put it in your calendar and sit down for five minutes and journal. Set a timer, just do five minutes. I know. All of it matters. Yeah. I know. I know. I know. I know. (laughs) I know. Like she's talking to me. I know. I know. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. I I want to just ask you a couple of more, maybe more specific questions, and then um, sure we'll kind of wrap it up. But I just speaking of, and you've talked about a couple of things, but I wanted to ask you if there was anything else you might bring up for those of us who have younger kids that we can start to foster, you know, open lines of communication with our kids as they get older, start to create that healthy environment for, for what's coming, you know, for those Mm -hmm. phases is when can we start? What can we do? I don't know. You can start when they're an infant, uh, work on looking them in the eye Mm -hmm. and connecting with them with your heart and soul. There's a difference. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between observing your child with your thinking brain and sitting with them with your feeling brain. I just got to chill. Yeah. Yeah. So look them in the eye and and tell them you are valid. Mm -hmm. I love you. When my daughter was a baby, one and a half or whatever, I, I did this all the time. But when she was more conscious that she was hurt, I would just hold her and I'd say, okay, honey, just... I know it hurts. Get the uglies out. It's okay to cry. <laughs> it's okay to cry. I'm, I'll am i be with you. I'm here as long as it takes. Mm-hmm. When you're ready to talk, I'm here to listen. Mm-hmm. So just keep saying those things to them. Like, you know, when you want to talk about how your heart feels, you want to talk about what your thoughts in your brain are, mm-hmm. start identifying for them their brain. Like sometimes our brain says one thing, but our heart feels another. Mm-hmm. So, you know, who do we listen to? We can listen to both, but what do we want to do? Interesting. You know, and start talking like that. Like, what does your brain say? I will always say to my daughter, wow, your brain is a clever brain. (laughs) What does your brain think about this? Wow. Yeah. You know, and 
And then I'll say, what does your heart feel about this? Mm. So start talking to them about emotions yeah. and have the, and then listen, yeah. don't lecture, right? Just listen. And, and I'm, I already know because I'm going to have to re- remind myself of this, that, you know, first time out the gate, you might not mm-hmm. get the answers that mm-hmm. you think you might get or want, or, mm-hmm. you know, it's. It's a practice. <laughs> it's a practice. It's a it requires process. requires patience. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes they'll say, I don't want to talk about it. And you say, okay, if you ever do, mm. I'm here to listen. Yeah. Yeah. We have to, mm-hmm. I think, just, it's um, the word that's coming to me is, is respect, you know, mm-hmm. too, with our kids. Respectful parents raise respectful kids. Yeah. I love that. You mm-hmm. you have a, you have a couple of other of those, you know. Entitled parents raise entitled yes, kids. Yes, there's a few more that are very, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> they hit it right on the head. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like the newer apple doesn't fall far from the tree kind of thing, you know. Oh. Hmm. Yeah, it makes an, you think. It's an update, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess one of the last questions specifically for tweens, teens that I have for you is, can you help me determine what maybe age appropriate moodiness is versus we've truly got something going on here. I mean, Mm. and and it might be more, it might, I mean, as I'm asking it, you did talk a a little bit about, um, you know, just noticing that a change in behavior or Mm -hmm. a change in communication style. Is there anything else you would add to that? Oh, boy. I would add if they're isolating more than usual, mm. even from their friends. Okay. That like Not so much from from parents, family. Like, we couldn't kind of expect that a little bit? No, if they're not isolating more than usual from parents, families, but they are from friends, mm-hmm. I wouldn't worry too see it's hard to say because I know everybody's different every situation is different but basically if you see a significant change in behavior happen pretty quickly yeah then I would say something's up that's not regular normal teenage behavior because regular normal teenage behavior is just up and down moody I mean it can cycle from hour to hour, right. you know? And so <laughs> that's pretty normal. But yeah. if you're, if you start to see any severe extremes on either ends, like manic behavior, serious depressive behavior, mm-hmm. or it suddenly changes, mm-hmm. then I would say those are warning signs that something else may be going on. It might not be a diagnosis. It could be just, maybe they were assaulted at a party last weekend Mm -hmm. and suddenly all stop. Right. They still need to talk to a counselor, but it doesn't mean that they're going to be diagnosed with something, Right. you know, but it needs to be talked about. So I look for that kind of stuff. Okay. All right. And, um, is there anything that you would have asked yourself or brought up that I did not, that you want to mention now? Um, I don't know. I think we we pretty much covered it. I would say definitely if your kid is LGBTQIA, Mm. um, a person of color, they're adopted, there's a disability going on, Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so they kind of, in today's society, have a challenge in that sense. Yes. Uh, you might want to pay a little more attention to them. Now, that doesn't mean like, you know, single them out and, you know, like smother helicopter lawnmower parents. It just (laughs) means like taking into consideration that our society is not as accepting and equal and um, inclusive as we would love it to be. So kids that, you know, identify as LGBTQIA or are autistic, they're going to have a little more of a challenge. So I think um, being sensitive to that would be important. I'm really glad you said that because Mm -hmm. I think, at least for me, I tend to think about, I mean, obviously being a parent, we've talked a lot about parenting, right? But 
when I think of the t tween teen years for myself, I think of just so much kid drama, right? But mm -hmm. when you bring up something like that, I can imagine that kids with considered even the slightest bit different in some way, their their trauma or their drama or their mm -hmm. their whatever their their negative experience may actually come from adults. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So I've had um on several occasions I've had clients, you know, LGBTQIA, um, neurodivergent, mm -hmm. uh, with a disability or person of color, they, they come to me and me as a white counselor, I have to take, I have to remember that they are very aware of the fact that I'm white and they're different yes. <laughs> or I'm neurotypical, they're neurodivergent. They are very aware of that. So yeah. I try, I bring it up. I yeah. talk about it right away. Yeah. So bring it up with your kids. Talk about it. What yeah. are your experiences? I understand that, you know, there might be things that I might say and do. It's not intended to offend you. And I'm open to correction. Mm. But there are different cultures. There are different, you know, every, you know, I talk, I can talk all day about the helpful versus unhelpful parent. But I'm still coming from my perspective right. in the system that I was raised yes. in. I, I was not raised in a Native culture or a Hispanic, Latinx culture or right. a Black culture. Like, I, it, it, it's different. Absolutely. You know, yeah. trauma is trauma. But the way different cultures raise their kids, we have to honor and respect that, too, yes. and take that into consideration. I'm glad you I'm glad you brought that up. I, I do think we could go on for another hour about that. Yeah, so yeah. I will I will wrap it here. But I'm glad that it, you brought it up and it was mentioned because I think we all those of us sitting, especially from the perspective of the white woman to white women mm -hmm. here sitting, talking about it. We all need the reminder. And we yep. all need to constantly be bringing be bringing that to awareness. So th I thank you for doing that. Um, mm -hmm. And just lastly, Jax, where can everyone find you, connect with you? You have so many resources for parents and kids. I mean, I'm taking advantage of it and I don't even have kids this age yet. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think Instagram and TikTok is where I hang out a lot for social media platforms. Uh, there's also, uh, you can send me, you can text me questions with hashtag AskJax to one seven one seven five ask jacks okay. um register and i will send you a video response to your question it's awesome um i'm also on the new app hi ho i think that's fun and that's a this video engagement yeah it's it's actually kind of like when you make a facebook post and people comment except it's video comments oh so yeah it's really cool and I have a website. I feel so old my, right now. I know, I know, I know. I, have, I just found out about it too. I have a website at um, psychotherapist.com. I think you're probably going to put this in the, show, in the notes. show notes. All in the okay. show notes. Okay. Yeah. And um, there is where my digital downloads, you can find those. Um, yeah, those are great resources for parents. Excellent. Well, yeah. thank you so much for your time. I so enjoyed talking to you. Like I said, I feel like I could talk for another hour, but um, <laughs> I think we got to some really good stuff and I, I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Okay. You love her, right? Because I love her and I literally want her on speed dial. <laughs> Thankfully, I feel like I kind of do. Recently, Jax helped me with some questions around making my first TikTok. So if you're not following me there yet, you can find me at Sass Says. Anyway, so much to unpack here. I love Jax's whole philosophy on setting an intention for your exercise. And if you've clicked around my website, you've seen the area where you can sign up for instant advice. When you click on the body category, you'll get an email deep diving how I've taken this suggestion and like absolutely run with it. I've taken it to heart, all those cliches, but it works. Slowing down and acknowledging when my workout is for my mental health versus my physical health can take so much pressure off. Before I had so much pressure, make every workout intense, sweaty, aka draining, but 
The truth is sometimes I just need to move my body to keep my routine going. I've been saying it almost acts like a placeholder. And sometimes I just need to move my body to clear my mind. So setting this intention has helped me tremendously. In creating this new habit for myself, I was thinking about how it pretty closely ties to one of Jax's main points to all of us parents. And that is that modeling is key. Modeling our behavior around screen time modeling our conversational behavior, and modeling taking care of ourselves are all critical for the development of our kids. So if I'm being really honest, I don't always like it. (laughs) I don't always like intentionally setting my phone aside or speaking calmly when I'm upset. But the truth is, is that I want my kids to quote unquote model my, I meant to do the quote unquote over this word, good The truth is I want my kids to model my quote unquote good behavior, but I really don't want them to model my quote unquote bad behavior, but that's just it, right? They're going to see it all. So this isn't saying we have to be perfect, but if we want, like Jack says, our kids to look at us when we're speaking to them instead of scrolling, I need to look at my kids instead of scrolling. If I want my kids to know that it's important to put themselves first every now and then and take care of themselves and exercise, they need to see me doing that. So parenting is hard. It is so hard. But what I love about Jax is that she gives you actionable tips and tools and she tells you why it matters. So if you haven't seen her TikToks yet, I highly recommend checking her out. I don't have tweens or tweens in my house just yet, but it's definitely nice to get a sneak peek. I've also learned a lot about how to communicate and connect with some of my family members who are tweens and teens to just sort of get a general idea of what they're thinking and feeling and what they like and what's going on. Um, And truly, most strategies around communication can be applied to anyone of any age. So thank you, Jax. I'm sure I'll be circling back to you for a part two when my kids get a little bit older. And thank you for being here and for tuning in. And I will, uh, yeah, I'll catch you next time. Bye. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Sass Says is a production of Luann Nigara, Inc., This podcast is meant to be educational and not meant to replace professional therapy or professional medical attention. To learn more about today's show and what's new in my world, head over to sassays.com. Thanks so much. Talk later.